this agent. There's absolutely no overlap, but I'm going to compliment that, especially uh, Nitin did a fantastic job digging into uh, more on the validity analysis. I mean, freedom to operate is not just one aspect of infringement versus non-infringement, as opposed to validity and the non-validity of the final uh, under consideration. So it's both are very, very important. Uh, and the, what I'm going to present to you is mostly on the US perspectives, because I'm a US patent attorney, and I can speak uh, a little bit more with uh, US procedures, and especially with Kerry uh, being here, you can appreciate it more than I do. Uh, with the AIA coming into force, it acts even more uh, trouble for the patent team than for the infringers, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's a challenging time period. Again, I just want to put my disclaimer so that uh, whatever I say is my own. And, uh, 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 let me just uh, provide you a uh, basic uh, outline. And again, a uh, lot of this I uh, will just go through very quickly so that we can have a lot of discussion. I think that would be very interesting. And since uh, one advantage I have is I'm the last speaker. If you want to have any burning questions, stop me. We can uh, have that discussion right there. Otherwise, I'll finish it and then throw it opportunity for the inter q and uh, The sum of the slides, like I said, uh, I will not go through because I don't want to repeat all the things. And I think some of the things you see here, uh, the major topics on the validity and the design around which we did not hear at all. So I'll uh, probably touch base on that for more and uh, conclude with uh, licensing uh, segment. Uh, a few considerations. I think we heard quite a bit on the expansive search. I don't want to dwell much more than that, especially Rahul said quite uh, nicely on, I mean, actually there's a live uh, example on basic right now, but not in China, but in Japan. Uh, it's the same problem, especially if you're involved in non-English juris jurisdictions. It's extremely important to make sure you abide by the local procedures and also abide by the local patents. And Japan is no exception, unfortunately. It's the same issue we are facing. And uh, we have to engage a lot of our Japanese agents to make sure we are getting good searches and finding that, that Jap Japan relevant uh, patterns. And unfortunately, in this case, that's tons of them. So, so that does happen. It's a like example. Um, so I don't, I don't want to expand more than that. On the other hand, I mean, if you are looking at uh, simple freedom to operate search, there's nothing called simple, but I mean, the, uh, in a simplistic uh, way, if you do find uh, nothing, which is very rare in the case, but sometimes it does happen that there's no inhuman patterns, you are free to go. I mean, uh, you have full freedom to operate, uh, but again, you have to ensure, I think, uh, we do front up, I think, the, Topic of you know, it's not a question of just the. I think she was raising on the other aspects of the IP, but also at the same time, if you're looking at the compound, uh, you be wary of. I mean, composition matter in general, you be wary of. You know, the process associated with it. There may be a uh, very preferred process to make it. Maybe it's not a novel compound. I mean, there will be a lot of other issues and the related patterns available too. So you cannot decide to what you are looking at. Uh, you want to launch the product. In fact, this is a classic example. It happened, ended up for uh, just a long time ago, much more too much details. And we heard about the damages. I think this was this case was an acetic acid, which is a very simple chemical. Uh, and uh, my previous employer, Herc Salinas, became very rich by suing getting in every jurisdiction BP, a, the infringer in that case. So they sued. And that's, so what happens in that situation is you know, it's a process pattern. So in process patterns, if you get clever, you can have some fingerprint uh, uh, identification procedures so that you can simply say, you infringer, you really use my process. And that's exactly how seven is used in that litigation. And they were successful in every jurisdiction, I remember, suing BP and one. So you have to be very careful of the process side of it. Uh, if it is a use related, uh, especially in the pharma sector, so you need to make sure there are no patterns in that one. You buy something. So you need to go into pretty expensive searches. It's not just one area. So you need to see what are those. And we already talked quite a bit on the jurisdictional. I mean, the jurisdictional is extremely important. I mean, sometimes you may have a full freedom to operate in one country, but you may have a real problems in uh, some other country. So, so be wary of where the eventual product is going to be made or sold. So both of those are important. And 
uh, typically what happens is this, that's why I put in uh, even though it's the bottom, the dominant pattern always exists somewhere or in some shape or form. In uh, almost every jurisdiction, so you need to see where you can go, and that's when you get into more detailed infringement and other analysis. <coughs> um, again, I think we heard quite a bit on the infringement analysis, but I think uh, this spells out a little bit more in uh, detail what is involved in infringement analysis, and the simplest always being the literal infringement. And you heard in many talks that all in and rule, so that is there. It's very easy, but many of it is not that simple. So there may be jurisdictions, including US, which is still uh, pendulum keeps on swinging on the doctrine of equivalence, and many other jurisdictions have that one. Uh, so be careful about doctrine of equivalence, and that's when you get into the full-blown analysis of the problem.